Good evening. I'm Reverend Carrie Jackson with RCRC and so delighted that you have joined us today. We have some amazing panelists and I'm not just saying that because that's what the host is supposed to say. It is the absolute truth and I'm so honored to have each of them with us and, and you'll learn more about them very shortly. But at first I want to tell you about the religion and Repro Learning Center. This webinar is part of our learning center that we just kicked off a couple of months ago. And we have two more webinars the next two weeks coming up. First, we will talk about the Catholic controversy, really looking at the Catholic Church's changing position on contraception. And that will be next Tuesday, March 2nd, and the very following Tuesday, we will be talking about the role that Christian women have played in the anti-abortion movement. Please don't miss either of those. At the very end of this month, the very end of, of March, on March 30th, we will have a team of state legislators with us to talk about how their colleagues who have an anti-abortion perspective how they're introducing bills and what do those of us who believe in women having the right to make decisions about their own body, what are some of the things that we can do in a proactive way? So please be sure to tune in and participate for those. If you have not registered, please make sure you do rcrc.org and then you will find the Learning Center and opportunities for you to register for those. So wonderful, so glad you're here. So I'm gonna introduce our, our moderator for, for today, then she will introduce our guest speakers. So my friend, and I call her that because we met several months ago and just knew there was a beautiful connection and I think um, I'm very grateful for that. And that is Reverend Brandy Jasmine Mimitzmeyer, I, of course, I said it fine when we're not on air. Um, Mimitzrayim. Um, Brandy was ordained an itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 2003. She holds a master's degree of divinity from Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary and a master of philosophy. She is currently working to complete her PhD at Drew University. Casperson School of Graduate Studies, where I also graduated. She serves as an assistant and associate pastor in AME congregations throughout the country. She has done this in Chicago, Denver, Orange, New Jersey, and she is currently the pastor in Lincoln, Nebraska of the Mighty Quinn Chapel. Reverend Brandy, thank you so much for being with us today. I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackson, uh, Carrie, for that introduction. Um, I am so excited today to hear from both of our wonderful speakers. Um, we're going to hear from them one at a time, but I want to introduce both of them to you now. Uh, Deirdre, Deirdre Cooper Owens is an award-winning historian and popular public speaker. She is a Charles and Linda Wilson Professor in the History of Medicine and Director of the Humanities, Medicine, Humanities in Medicine program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, in this position, Dr. Cooper Owens is one of two black women in the US running a medical humanities program. She is also the director of the program in African-American history at the Library Company of Philadelphia, the country's oldest cultural institution. She earned her PhD in history at UCLA and has had a fellowship at the University of Virginia, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She has been acclaimed at has been acclaimed experts in US history by Time Magazine. And Lincoln is so wonderfully lucky to have her here. And then Dr. Monique Moultrie is an associate professor of religious studies at Georgia State University. Her pursuits include projects in sexual ethics, African-American religions, and gender and sexuality studies. Her research has been supported by a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship a Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning grant, a GSU Dean's Early Career Award, and an American Academy of Religion Individual Research grant. Her recent publications include her book, Passionate and Pious Religious Media in Black Women's Sexuality, 
a co-edited volume, A Guide for Women in Religion, Making Your Way from A to Z. And she is currently working on a book on Black lesbian religious leaders and ethical leadership. Outside of the university, Dr. Moultrie was a consultant for the National Institutes of Health and the Lesbian Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Transgender Religious Archives Network. She is a content development working group member for Columbia University Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice, and the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choices Scholars Group, a group of religious scholars collaborating at the intersection of religion and reproductive justice. We are about to have a really wonderful time um, with these beautifully intelligent and wise and well-learned women. So first we're gonna start with Deirdre Cooper Owens um, and then pivot to Monique Moultrie. Dr. Owens. Okay, I am sharing my screen and I needed to, <laughs> to unmute. So first off, thank you so much to, uh, for RCRC having me. Thank you to our moderator, to uh, my other uh, co-panelists. Um, and so this is a really wonderful because it allows me to talk about the thing that has engaged my life um, most consistently for three years. And that's talking about reproductive justice. But because I am a historian, I also like to put the past in conversation with the present. Now, the one thing I am not good at <laughs> is being really concise but I'm going to do my best to really hammer home the points um, that, that undergird our theme, property and products, reproductive oppression, right? And reproductive oppression as it relates to uh, Black women across time and across space. I'd also like to thank uh, Reverend Carey for reaching out to me and inviting me uh, to have this conversation with you all and to the attendees. So first I'll start with... Um, what, what, what really gives me expertise, right? So I wrote a book about the history of American gynecology a few years back. And it, that's the thing I always tell people, I use the same sources as historians had done before me. I didn't really have a different historical, you know, kind of historical practice or approach except for telling the history from the perspective of the patients. And in this case, where I'm looking at race, gender, and uh, American gynecology's origins, I was specifically looking at enslaved women. And I really wanted to have a conversation about what medical racism was and what it is. And so that brings me to, you know, and I, I talk to my students and I talk to a lot of audiences when I give my talks about the ways that we sometimes think of medical racism as this thing that was past. Right, this kind of old school, uh, you know, race science that emerged in the 1700s, in the 1800s, and so I point them to this this guy named Samuel Cartwright. Some of you may have heard of him, maybe others have not. But Sam Cartwright was a doctor who becomes pretty notorious in the antebellum era, so right before slavery, and he writes an article about peculiar Negro diseases because he was really concerned as a medical researcher whether enslaved Negroes, as they were called then, were fit for freedom. And so he found in his research, and this was not research he, he wanted to do just because he had an idea, the state of Louisiana, their medical association, in fact, invited him to do this research, right? So here he is a leading thinker, he's, he's doing this research. And what he finds is, in fact, the Negro does have a kind of biological peculiarity compared to white people. And so one of the diseases he found was drapetomania, right? The thought of harboring, uh, running away as mental illness. But what he does where he literally merges science and, and medicine or medical research is in the 18, in the 1860s, well, actually a little bit before uh, 1860s, he conducts the first race-based study using a new medical tool, the spirometer. In fact, the spirometer is used today, right, to assess or measure lung capacity. And the really interesting thing, Cartwright finds that in fact, the Negro has a lessened lung capacity, which goes to prove his, his theory that Negroes are really unfit, right? That they are inferior biological species. And there are all kinds of ideas about black people's biological difference or alleged biological differences during this time. Typically, 
particularly in the 21st century, we think we've gotten away from those ideas. But what's really interesting is in 2016, the University of Virginia, a PhD student in psychology, uh, she's now a, a doctor, but Kelly Hoffman wanted to interview, do a study of UVA medical schools, uh, medical residents, some of the physicians and students. Now, the reason I like to pick on UVA, lest someone thinks I'm being biased, I'm like, I kind of am. I did my postdoc at UVA. And let's just say some of you may have graduated from UVA. People at that school are very proud to, to be graduates of this elite institution. And so here you have medical residents and students at UVA who already have an undergraduate degree believing some of the same ideas that Samuel Cartwright had. So in this study that was published in 2016, Hoffman and, and her team found that white medical residents and students believed that black people had thicker skin, that black people aged faster than white people biologically, that black people didn't experience pain. I mean, and it goes on and on. And so here, is this moment where I'm saying, no, 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 Medi the legacy of medical racism is still with us. It's still something that we have to talk about. And what made my work, I think, pertinent to the kind of cultural and political moment about three years ago is when this uh, controversy arose around James Marion Sims' statue being removed from Central Park, right? Should it, should it go, should it stay? And I was living in uh, Brooklyn teaching at Queens College in New York and my book hadn't come out yet. And I remember people were really, you know, kind of reaching out to me, hey, did you, did you uh, organize this protest that's gonna go down in Central Park in front of Simpson statue? Didn't know what they were talking about. Come to find out members of the Black Youth Project 100 who you see here had organized a protest to really highlight the lives of the enslaved women that Sims had experimented on. And so my press, literally publishes my book months earlier than it was supposed to, to ride, as he said, the political wave. And what really bothered me in some ways, not about the book being published early, but every time a journalist would talk to me, they wanted to talk about the kind of sensational aspect of this story. Should the statue be removed or should it stay? And I was much more interested in A, providing context around slavery and the history of gynecology, but also centering and privileging the lives of black women and really talking about the, the legacy of medical racism. And so what I wanted to do away with was this notion that somehow James Marion Sims, the father of American gynecology was exceptional. And so for those who've read the book, you know, my first chapter literally outlines all of these elite white slave owning physicians who pioneered gynecological surgery and work, but they did so on the bodies of black women. And I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanna show you the ways that the theme that we're talking about, right? Property and products. I'm gonna focus on someone that a lot of folk don't know one, right? Uh, don't know about, excuse me, uh, Francois Marie Provost. He was French born. He uh, was uh, educated in a medical school in France. He then goes to Haiti right before the Haitian Revolution and begins experimental work on Haitian enslaved women, trying to perfect, as he would write, the C-section. So that's literally in the late 18th century, in the early 19th century, here you have this man well before Sims is doing this, cutting open the bellies of these pregnant slaves and, and trying to perfect the C-section. Right around the time that the Haitian Revolution begins, he moves to Louisiana, another former French colony. And Louisiana's a state, he becomes a slaveholder there as he was in Haiti, and guess what he continues? His experimental work on Louisiana enslaved women. And what is interesting, right, from the moment that Provost starts this work, right, until the 20th century, it transforms the state of Louisiana. Louisiana literally for almost a century, if not a little longer, becomes a state where more black women undergo C-sections than any other racialized group, right? And so when we think about even the legal definitions of these women, that they occupy two statuses. They are object, you know, objects as slaves, right? As movable property or chattel, but also they're subjects 
right? Because you can't perform this kind of surgery on a table, which is movable property, right? Or your or your T your T set. But that's the kind of duality that these women who have literally been commodified into products become. And so I'm going to skip through some of the others, but talk about you know um, the ways that you know I'll end with uh, maybe Sims, right? But talk about the ways that even medical technology was created, um, perfected on enslaved women's bodies, right? Especially during this time. And largely this is because during the colonial period all the way until the end of slavery. For, so from the 1680s, right? When the law first appears until 1865, almost 200 years, what this, this, this colony of several different European empires that later becomes the United States, what they do that's very different than any other place when it came to, to enslaved people, they said, if you're an enslaved woman, guess what? If you give birth to a child, we don't care who the father is. We don't care if the father's free, black, white, native, we don't care. But we do care if you're enslaved and you give birth to a child because slavery's propagation relies on the health of your reproductive system. Because when you give birth to a child, that means that the child inherits your slave status for life. And they did so because they understood that the reproductive health of enslaved women literally meant that the economic institution of slavery would continue and would in fact uh, flourish, right? And so in many ways, it becomes very different, right? The black women don't have power. The only power that is granted through the system, right? If we think about it in this kind of perverse way is the commodification of your bonded status to your child. Right through the, the legislative means of, of these elite white white men. And so these men, right, men like Sims and some of the others that I've mentioned are much more concentrated on maintaining or creating the reproductive health of enslaved women than when slavery ends in 1865. All of a sudden, the very thing that these women have been praised for Right. In fact, these and not because the doctors cared about them in any kind of benevolent way, but it really was the means to keep the system going right after the African uh, international slave trade had ended. And so the, the natural increase of, of domestic slaves within that trade had to be a priority. So 1865 comes Civil War is ended. And all of a sudden, the very thing that these men had praised these women for, their alleged ability to give birth easily and without pain, all of a sudden they become right, dependent welfare queens by the 20th century. Financial burdens in the 21st century, all of a sudden they're irresponsible baby mamas. And that brings us to another part of the legacy. And I'm gonna wind down here, right? The legacy of medical racism today is that in freedom, Black women literally share the same statistics as they did their foremothers in the 19th century, meaning Black women are three to four times more likely to suffer from pregnancy-related complications, so maternal morbidity and mortality, and so are their children, right? And lest we think that it is race as was asserted for centuries that, oh, there's something about the pathology of Blackness that creates this. Finally, people are beginning to listen to those black women who had been advocating for reproductive justice for decades, right? And what we now know, thanks to the, the research of scholars like Rachel Hardiman, who is a black uh, researcher in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, this appeared in the Washington Post just last month and she found it's not race, but in fact, in over a million cases in the state of Florida, for black women who were giving or birthing people who had given birth to their children, the maternal morbidity and mortality rates had been cut by 50% when the physicians and the nurses and the midwives looked like the patients because they did not have to deal with that other factor, right? Of having anti-blackness be integrated into the healthcare experience. So I'm gonna stop um, because I'm really interested to hear what my uh, colleague and co-panelist has to offer and to really be in conversation um, with she and, and our moderator. So thank you very much for your time.
That was absolutely fascinating, Deirdre. And if uh, I could pause here just to ask a question of, of Deirdre before we move on to Monique. Sure, sure. Um, can you just say just a little bit more other than the, the maternal mortality rates, wow, well, getting that out, about how the legacy of racism in women's reproductive, in Black women's reproductive health um, still impacts us today? Is, is there any other ways just than killing us? <laughs> You know, this is this is an interesting thing, and this is what I often say. I do a lot of grand rounds for for hospitals and medical colleges and schools of nursing, and often the physicians, right? The medical practitioners have the same thing. What can we do? And I'm like, guess what? Reproductive justice and birthing justice activists are are essentially asking for you to treat us the same way that you treat white patients. There's literally no magic formula, right? You don't have to change any kind of um, examination. You don't have to prep differently. What folk want these, these folk to do, right? The OBGYNs, the nurses, the, the midwives is to stop being anti-Black, is to literally respect and listen to their patients, to not patient blame. So almost all of the things, right, that we tend to think about as being kind of 20th and 21st century inventions I'm like, no, if you look back at these old sources, literally you have doctors doing the same thing. And thank goodness for people like Kelly Hoffman who I highlighted from uh, when she was a student at UVA, right? People tend to listen when white folks say the very thing that black folk have been saying for years. Hoffman's, her study is important, but it's no different than what Sister Song had been saying since the 1990s, right? It's, it's, it's no different. So what we're literally saying is, listen to your patients, treat them with respect, stop pathologizing black patients. You in fact, don't have to do anything different medically. What you have to do is change your ethics and the kind of moral compass that you have towards these human beings that even if you're not aware, you're treating as less than, and the stats are showing that when black doctors are treating these black women and black birthing people, that the rates are being cut in half in certain places. And so that leads me to believe that it is really the kind of the legacy of racism that is you know, compelling these people um, to, to harm us. And that has to change. And also I always advocate for something punitive to happen because we know who the rotten apples are. I guarantee if there's something punitive, they'll stop. That part. Thank you so much. Um, so. For those who are watching and have joined us, please feel free to, to have chat and discussion in the chat box. And if you have questions for either Deirdre or Monique, please put them in the Q&A. And if you see a question that you find to be intriguing or that you find interesting, please upvote it so that we can see that this is something that we really, really need to answer and really need to ask of our panelists. Um, and at this time, uh, we will hear from Monique Moultrie. Thank you. I think we'll segue pretty well together because I start uh, with the earlier this month Congress package of bills on maternal health, um, the Momnibus Act of 2021. So this act uh, actually came forward in 2020. It was a bill that was never brought to a vote. But currently our lawmakers are optimistic about this year's maternal health efforts, which include proposals to invest in community-based community care, for Black mothers to seek to improve mental and maternal health data collection, to improve the mental health for postpartum mothers. And it also includes data uh, collection and COVID-19 vaccinations for uh, learning how COVID impacts pregnancy. Particularly uh, new is also a focus from this summer on looking at the environmental pollution and maternal outcomes to how quality of life impacts the uh, maternal health of children. And these bills are a welcome opportunity to address some of the health disparities and implicit biases that Dr. Owens just mentioned to us, but I think it also offers us an opportunity to have a conversation around reproductive oppression and how we can link reproductive oppression to resistance modes of activism uh, currently. So for me, one of the concrete ways that I think about this 
uh, is particularly within looking within the framing of the movement for Black lives and reproductive justice. And so that's where I'm going to shift our conversation for the time that I have with us. So I'm gonna sort of concentrate in three moves. First, I wanna look at some of the historical instances where Black women have resisted organized efforts to restrict their reproductive autonomy. So what does it mean to think about uh, Black women as active agents who are not just oppressed, but who have been working for a long time uh, to have their own reproductive autonomy, to be able to be self-determining? I also want to look at the concept of Black liberation through the lens of reproductive justice, really highlighting uh, the idea of choosing to parent or not to parent as two ways uh, in which these are active responses to reproductive oppression. And finally, I wanna to hint towards or move towards a conversation of how can religious community members uh, and religious scholars be involved in interrogating reproductive justice as a liberatory praxis so that we are seeking to not just respond to the situation, but to change the situation. So as was mentioned, uh, this longstanding history of reproductive oppression comes with reproductive choice and black women's reproductive choice being constrained by white supremacy. During slavery, black women resisted being forced to breed to fulfill white supremacy capitalist agendas by active and passive forms of resistance. Historian Deborah White contends that enslaved Black women sought reproductive control of their own destiny by regulating their fertility. They feigned illness to avoid having sex. They faked pregnancies to avoid actually getting pregnant. They ran away to avoid sexual advances. And if all of this failed, they induced self-induced miscarriages to prevent having children caught up in the slaveocracy system. They also took more drastic measures such as poisoning slaveholders or infanticide, which was popularly depicted in Toni Morrison's book Made a Film, A Beloved. After emancipation and reconstruction, Black women sought to reconnect their biological families as evidenced by the numerous newspaper advertisements seeking to reunite kin. During the early 20th century, so I'm thinking here around 1920, Black women actively participated in the nascent birth control movement. And in the 21st century, they've been active in fighting for reproductive access, reproductive rights, and reproductive autonomy. Historically, these individual acts represent collective resistance as each generation gleamed from prior generations. So it's not just an individual act, but it's an individual act with communal uh, response. So why do I think this falls in the guidelines or in the framework of liberation? Well, I wanna give us a common definition. So I'm using as a dominant frame, Kianga Yamada Taylor's text from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. And here I'm gonna quote from her lengthy definition. She defines Black liberation as a world, and I'm quoting her, where Black people can live in peace without the constant threat of social, economic, and political woes of a society that places almost no value on the vast majority of Black lives. Black liberation would mean living in a world where Black lives matter. While it is true that when Black people get free, everyone gets free, Black people in America cannot get free alone. In that sense, Black liberation is bound up with the project of human liberation and social transformation." End quote. Here, what Taylor is recounting is the 1977 assertion from the Black Women's Combahee River Collective that true liberation comes from creating a world where Black women are free, since removing obstacles to their freedom and their female subjectivity would also necessitate destruction of all systems of oppression for everyone else. In this unbounded reality, true black autonomy from reproductive oppression would require what biblical scholar and preacher Reverend Dr. Renita Weems describes as a womanist hermeneutic of liberation. This liberation, liberatory hermeneutic changes consciousness and also transforms power structures. So that's why I'm linking Black Lives Matter into this discussion of reproductive oppression and resistance modes. Because I think that when we look at the Trust Black Women Partnership, which officially linked leaders from the Black Lives Matter National Movement 
and the New Voices for Reproductive Justice organization to, to discuss the intersectionality of these movements. I think what we've learned from this solidarity is that these are all actions that are born out of the leadership of Black women, and they are born out of a demand for self-determination and liberation for Black people. So if we take as given an affirmation of Black life, the promotion of dignity, the promotion of autonomy, being able to do with my body what I want, and seeking to dismantle the systems that harm and oppress Black communities, I think it's worthy to uplift reproductive justice as a resistance model to Black reproductive oppression. So again, another um, definition would be helpful in anchoring our conversation. What do I mean by reproductive justice? So here, I, what I'm talking about in reproductive justice is in its simplest terms, a human rights framework created by 12 Black women in 1994 and women of color activists who are focused on understanding reproduction as a component of overall liberation. Its main pillars are the right to have a child under the conditions of one's choosing, the right to not have a child using birth control, abortion or abstinence, and the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments free from violence by the state or individuals. I'm privileging this definition, which I'm taking from Sister Song, which was just mentioned, uh, because they emphasize reproductive justice as communal and not just about individual choice and access. My overarching um, idea that I wanna have us talk about is how reproductive justice as a response to reproductive oppression is actually addressing these oppressive categories. So it's addressing population control where black women especially are discouraged from procreating. Um, we're all concerned about the world's population when it's about certain communities uh, being um, able to reproduce. The environmental injustices that are involved with black communities uh, often being targets for uh, environmental racism. So communities where uh, like Detroit still doesn't have clean, Flint doesn't have clean drinking water. Uh, these are acts of environmental racism that reproductive justice tries to speak to and says, having water that our children can drink is a reproductive oppression and it's a justice issue. Immigration rights, economic injustice, land sovereignty, militarism, and criminalization of black women and women of color are all issues that reproductive justice tries to address. So with the time that I have, um, I wanna close with this close attention to these two prongs. One, parenting in healthy and safe environments and not parenting at all. So if we take Taylor's understanding of liberation as only possible when our hierarchy of needs are met, when we're not constrained by the threat of social, economic and environmental oppression, then what does it mean to parent, to choose to parent in a racist supremacist state? Here I'm influenced by the idea of revolutionary mothering as conceived of by theorists Alexis Pauline Guns, China Martins and Maya Williams. And their aptly titled text, Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines, they present mothering as existing beyond biology. So it's not just about your womb, but it's about nurturing, creating, affirming, and supporting life as a radical and revolutionary practice. One of the essayists in the text, Cynthia Oka, explores mothering as a revolutionary practice, but one that meets individual and communal needs. As she discusses mothering as a task in raising and nurturing whole, resilient individuals, as well as autonomous communities of resistance. So mothering here is, is resistant specifically because Black mothers have not historically been allowed to parent. We can go back to the removal of their children in enslavement, to the economic necessity of being forced domestic care in white women's homes instead of their own, to the mass incarceration and criminalization and violence that is perpetrated against Black women. So the act of being able to parent and to parent in a healthy, safe environment in a world where motherhood is silently coded as white provides Black women with the value of motherhood that others in society have been able to access. 
Black motherhood is politicized care is a defiant act that can be examined locally and communally. Here, I'm talking about the personal acts of parenting, which involve seeking safe environments to rear one's young, as well as the communal act of parenting that is disobedient to the powers that seek to eradicate Black life. Literary theorist Danielle Morgan conceives of visible Black motherhood as a form of resistance. And she especially connects the mothers of the movement for Black lives to historical activist mothers who are committed to justice work. She points out that the broad platform of the movement for Black lives refers to the participation of parents in four of its six demands. In particular, these mothers who have lost a child through ritualized state violence they seek to catalyze their grief to bring about social change. While I don't have time to unpack the individual trauma-informed responses of Corinne Gaines, who was shot in her Baltimore home, or Sabrina Fulton, who was Trayvon Martin's mother, or Leslie McSpadden, who was Mike Brown's mother, or Geneva Reed Veal, who was Sandra Bland's mother, I don't have time to unpack each of their responses, but I turn to one signal act of resistance their participation and appearance in Beyonce's video for her song Freedom in the Lemonade film as an example of resistant tactics. So why go to Phil? Much like Emmett Till's mother, Mamie, used the medium of her day, Jet Magazine, to let the world see what the racist murderers had done to her son. These mothers of the movement appear in Beyonce's video, holding photographs of their murdered children, demanding the audience to visualize their Black motherhood and their loss. These mothers have agitated publicly for justice that has been mostly denied them. And they have become activists campaigning for safe environments for children to live unmolested by violence. While this is one example of choosing to parent as resistance, I also wanna highlight the politicized care of parenting that comes from parents like Black Lives Matter mother Patrice Cullors who agitates at the local level for federal and local initiatives for programming to demilitarize law enforcement, to guarantee public control of public institutions like civilian review boards of the police. These examples connect to the earlier mentioned Black maternal health bill in protecting Black motherhood and making safe spaces for community members to thrive. Yet the brilliance of reproductive justice is not that it just demands motherhood. It celebrates and encourages those who want to participate in this mechanism of politicized care. Yet it also embraces those who choose not to parent by providing them the access and the resources that they need to remain child free. Voluntarily child free women resist pronatalist culture that places supreme value on mothering. Ingrained into these assumptions of who should reproduce and whose reproduction should be oppressed are the ideas that reproductive oppression remains rampant in community of color because they are those who are presumed not worthy to reproduce. So when I'm looking at this lens of the voluntarily child free, reproductive justice encourages one to analyze this decision in light of agency and self-determination. Here, I wanna to speak to the reluctance of women of color to speak about their voluntary sterilization as liberatory because to speak of that also means to speak of the unprecedented amount of legacy of racist sterilization abuse that happens in community of color. Thus to choose not to parent in this option is liberatory because for some black women, it gives them control over major life events so that they have time to fight for liberation with their minds and not just their wombs it gives them the space to avoid the very real stigmatization that occurs when black women don't mother properly in quotations, where expectation is of procreation is expected, but at the very least, their participation in this model is questioned or challenged. It also offers an opportunity to discuss the myriad of reasons that black women choose to remain child free. I, I don't have time to discuss this myriad of reasons, but I'm gonna highlight one characteristic. Those who choose not to devote energy nurturing others because this might mean diminished capacities for nurturing themselves. Those who are choosing the individual act of self-care, a politicized self-care 
as a resistant model to the oppressive nature of just being and existing as a member of color, as a Black woman in American society. So this stigmatization, this diminished capacity, or this agency, as I want us to think about it, provides an opportunity to think about how do Black child-free women participate in communal practices that focus on struggle, that focus on resisting oppression, that focus on nurturing new ways of being and creating space. So if you stuck with me so far, um, you might be wondering, how does any of this connect to religion? Because I am actually a religion scholar. And so I want to conclude finally with a discussion of how I think reproductive justice can provide an ethos of liberatory praxis that religious communities can support. So largely here, I'm using the work of Dr. Tony Bond Leonard, who contends that religious communities should embrace a reproductive justice framework because it is these communities' responsibility to discuss and deliver on the needs of the people. She posits that Black mothers will need more than just a perfunctory baby basket, but they will need access to the social and economic support to house, clothe, and feed a child. Thus, religious communities are called to confront their sins of silence on the issues of reproductive well being and to participate in what womanist theologian Kelly Brown Douglas describes as a sexual discourse of resistance. So, part of what I wanted to do in this leaning in towards what religious communities can point us to is to think about the ways that whether you choose to parent or you choose not to parent, that both of these acts demand communal support. None of these acts are done in isolation. They're done in community. And thus, when I look at activist, longtime RJ activist Loretta Ross, she tells us to be optimistic that reproductive justice provides us a code, it provides us a framework, but be optimistic but not naive. So I, I don't want us to leave with the promise that reproductive justice can actually liberate everyone. I think it can give us the environments and the conditions for which liberation is possible for everyone. But I think more so than full liberation, what they can make possible is the smaller task that is involved with supporting the thriving of Black women in light of the oppressive, long-standing historical oppressions that besieged them. So I think I'll stop there and we'll take questions and I can fill in some gaps from where I jumped around. Thank you so much for that. Um, I really appreciate how you connect the Black Lives Matter movement to reproductive justice. And I guess my question is, how does the framework that you provided for that liberatory praxis through reproductive justice um, work for religious communities? And what does it, how does it function for Black birthing people who are working in and must contend with a really racist and harmful medical community? I think that yeah. Was so I, I, I appreciate the question. I think on one hand, there is a response of choosing life. So you have religious communities that encourage uh, people to choose camps. You're either pro-life or you're pro-choice. And I think that is so limited in its actual, like how it happens on the ground. People who are choosing life are also on the side of choice. <laughs> and they're on the side of choice that happens and occurs within public resources. So these choices aren't individualized so that the choice that I make is supported by public resource, by state dollars, by religious communities, by family units. And so for me, one of the ways of taking away from uh, the liberal notion of choice as it relates to participating in reproductive justice is this idea that true reproductive freedom, true choice, requires a lot of components. It requires a living wage. It requires universal health care. It requires the abolition of militarized states and politicized violence. It requires the covering of the needs, the basic human needs and the human rights that are ne necessary to actualize a choice. So for me, that's where religious communities can be involved to not just stand on the, the sidelines and say, oh, my community supports the right to choose or, oh, my community supports the sanctity of life, 
but to recognize that the sanctity of life for Blacks also requires the sacredness of Black life through all of its stages of development, through the full humanity of Blacks, through the full thriving of Black work, through the full thr thriving of Black intellectualism, through the full thriving of Black arts, et cetera. So all of these components are necessary, I think, and religious communities can be of support in uh, making that possible. Thank you for that thorough answer. Um, I would like, there she is, for Deirdre to come back. Um, we've got some questions in the Q&A that have been voted up. Uh, Tara, I wanna say that's your name. You asked a question that I think we might just need a little clarification on. So if you could put the clarification in the chat box, that would be helpful. So the first question is, how do we respond to Black women who claim the pro-choice movement is intended to reduce the number of births of Black children and that, that they are therefore against Planned Parenthood's abortion services? Uh, Three, rock, paper, scissor, I don't care. Yeah. Which, I want to say answer first. I, I'll offer my initial thoughts. Um, so my initial thoughts from, from this community, from this question is, Again, we, we need to expand this idea of, of what we're talking about. That when we're talking about Planned Parenthood, are we allowing the discussion to only be about abortion? Are we also talking about how Planned Parenthood provides comprehensive health care? Are we also talking about how uh, Planned Parenthood provides educational opportunities for comprehensive sex education so that persons can make informed sexual decisions so that they are not having unintended pregnancies? Because there is a link between the lack of access to health, sexual health information and the rise in unintended pregnancies. Black women, in fact, have the largest number of unintended pregnancies. And so if we want to stem abortion rates, what we actually need to do is be involved with the task of ceasing or limiting the unintended pregnancy rate. I, and I think that's where I would push and shift and say, we're only having part of this discussion and we're allowing uh, the religious right to determine where we're entering. I, I, I wanna take a step back and say, that's too small. Um, I, I am advocating for holistic health. And one of the components of holistic health is reproductive health. Um, my, my answer is gonna be pretty brief. I, I, was, I did a lot of uh, reproductive justice work in Mississippi. That was my first uh, teaching job. So gosh, a little bit over 10 years ago. And I encountered a lot of the folk um, that that you ask in the, in the question. And what I realized was they are oftentimes, more times than not, unwilling to be moved because for them it is a deeply philosophical um, and spiritual issue. And so for those women, even when you attempt to to not just educate, because I didn't never wanted to come off as I was somehow the, you know, the kind of purveyor of all knowledgeable things because I was a professor, but even in trying to um, tell them about the kind of holistic practice of what health meant, right? That it means examinations, that Planned Parenthood, depending upon the geographical location, also provides services to men, that you can get mammograms. They were not interested in that. For them, it was a very myopic conversation around um, abortion. Right, and that abortion was unethical. And so what I've learned, the older I've gotten, it is very tough to kind of remove people, to kind of disconnect them from that thinking. And so you do the work for everyone else um, because it can be a futile attempt. That doesn't mean that you stop doing the work. That doesn't mean that you don't extend empathy and grace, but these are what I've noticed in my, just in my own activism around reproductive justice. It was, it, it was just extremely hard. Um, you, you can't really engage in conversations um, with people who are unwilling to, to be moved from a, per a particular philosophical, spiritual point of view. And for them, pro-life is about liberation politics, right? Um, and so that is you know, something that I realized I just had to keep doing the work um, you know, in, in the world where people were interested in hearing about it, interested in having conversations, interested in not the kind of performative aspects of debating, 
um, but actually wanting to know more and me trusting that they had the insight um, and, they, and they had the, the honesty and the compassion to be self-reflective in maybe opening themselves up to a shift in the ways in which they thought. But that, that was you know, just my, my experience um, within this world and it has re unfortunately remained unchanged uh, from the time I got into this work in 2009. Um, and so I don't, you know, this is where I, I just don't see a lot of, of hope for that particular contingency changing their minds, unfortunately. There I am. Thank you. Um, so for both of the panelists, and if y'all could flip flop the way you answered this time. So if Deirdre, you could go first and then Monique, you could follow her. Um, Ziada. And I'm so sorry if I say that wrong. She asked, what is your opinion on the controversy and significance behind Black women choosing to switch from medical health institutions like hospitals to requesting midwives for at-home births? Yeah, this is, once again, um, it's not, you know what? A lot of hospitals and professional medical organizations, institutions are changing. I'm not saying that change, that transformation is complete, but I think because the numbers are so damning for the United States, right? When the US becomes the most dangerous place for a high earning country, right? For a black woman to have a baby in a high earning country or, you know, kind of in the past, it was called a developed nation. When it is the most dangerous place for black birthing people to give birth, all of a sudden you had the medical industry, physicians, practitioners now recognizing that they had very little to stand on because those numbers had remained unchanged for decades. So it's not as controversial as it had been, say, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. So for that, I'm hopeful. Um, I think that doctors are now trying to create more synergistic relationships with doulas and midwives. But I am really of the mind that the Black birthing person gets to decide where they give birth when they find out that they're pregnant. Um, and for far too many, uh, you know, and it, it doesn't matter whether you're in an urban environment or a rural environment, for far too many Black birthing people, it is just dangerous. And even when there aren't pregnancy complications, the ways that Black families are treated around birth, because the infants are sometimes put into, NIC, well, oftentimes put into NICU at dispro disproportionately larger numbers. And even when families are afraid and they're grieving and, and they're experiencing the full range of human emotions, security guards are, are sicked on them. So there's still this kind of criminalization that is attached to the birthing experience kind of writ large. And you're not going to have that experience at home or in a birthing center. And so hospitals have had to contend with the really damning statistics that has forced them to rethink their relationship and their, and their you know, kind of um, a renewed sense of what partnership looks like in terms of birth. Yeah, I think I, I agree with everything you've, you've just shared. I, I also think education is a component of the response um, because when my sorority sister had her first child, she chose a home birth uh, in a like pool situation. And when we were planning her baby shower and who was going to be there for the birth of the child, uh, I was freaked out. As an educated Black woman, I had been trained and indoct indoctrinated that, you know, the hospital care was going to be best. And who is this woman that's going to come in? And she actually did the work of educating me about uh, the historical nature of Black midwifery and how um, this, this institution was taken away from our women of color where they were the, the root healers, they were the healers in the community, both in slave communities and then in emancipated communities. Uh, and, and they were the keepers of life, the keepers of the stories of uh, reproductive histories of family units and, um, and how the medicalization process actually stripped us from that type of historical connection and that type of birthing care that comes from someone that knows your history that knows, yes, that your, your lineage has hard births or you have big babies or you have this or that. Um, and so that, that education process was one of the things that shifted 
my own internal mindset, but I also think that in light of the public, public nature of how black maternal morbidities are and in fact, the, the product of white racist systems, I, you know, I, I go back to Serena Williams and her sort of like having to share, like I almost died with all the access and the money that I have because my health needs weren't taken seriously. I advocated for myself. My husband advocated for me. She did quote unquote, everything right. She was married, she was rich. She was, you know, in a well cared for like established health environment and she still almost died. And so I think that those types of public, public um, moments have us to shift the discourse of, about, well, why, do, why is it that we think that this system is what's going to be best for our people? Because it hasn't been best for us with hypertension or best with us for strokes or best with us for X, Y, or Z. So why would anything be different for our uh, child rearing, our childbirth? So I, 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 I think that there's some shifting happening uh, behind the scenes, both through public education and the, you know the one-on-one -on -one private education of people just getting to know. And I also want to include in that conversation those who are also whole health doulas mm -hmm. who are also uh, willing and able to assist if a woman chooses to um, not extend her pregnancy, if a woman loses the pregnancy, or if there is uh, some event, stillbirth, et cetera, for which you were expecting one thing and you got another. So having these whole life uh, doulas that are, uh, are, are present, I think that's also helpful in, in shifting public opinion. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. Y'all, we have about 20 more minutes. So if you wanna ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box, vote up the ones that you wanna answer to so that we can see them and make sure we get an answer to them. Um, Tara asks, um, she's thinking of the concept of weathering that our line Geronimus has researched and she defines that as the health of African Americans is subject to early health deterioration as a consequence of social exclusion. Um, and she wants to know, what is, would you say uh, the role of weathering is in maternal and child mortality among pregnant and birthing black people? So, you know, I mean, weathering, it's interesting to me um, about this term. I mean, I agree with it. I agree with it. It's been out here, you know, for a long time, since I think 1970-ish or so. And it essentially is talking about the ways that racial discrimination, and in this case, we're talking about Black people, that anti-Blackness literally ages your body and harms your system. I do a lot of consulting work um, with like I said, a lot of medical organizations. I talk to a lot of OBGYNs and it's um, the, the medical director of Clue. If you haven't checked out that app, please check it out. It's, it's wonderful in terms of, of women's health and, health and reproductive health. But the medical director is a, a black woman uh, who was American born from the South and lives in Berlin, Germany now. Her name is Dr. Lene Bray, Brayboy. And as I was talking to her, I was shocked. I mean, I know the statistics, but sometimes just hearing it can, can just have you speechless. And so she talked about the ways that weathering and these kind of negative social determinants of health, right? So, so the anti-Blackness, poverty, living in spaces where you don't have access to, to healthcare at all, not just good healthcare, but healthcare at all, how we can age your body right, how it affects your body and black women in particular. And this is unlike any other racialized group in the nation in terms of the statistics and the studies we have. Black women, doesn't matter your relationship status, your education, none of that matters. Whereas those things matter for other groups. We literally have a negative response to the stressors that we receive based on racial and gender discrimination. And what that has done has literally increased our levels of cortisol. So when you go to sleep, your body is supposed to be in a restorative mood, I mean mode, right? You're supposed to be sleeping and restoring yourself. Here our bodies are having to literally fight to try to regain balance because of the stressors that we've had, right? And so, Couple that with, you know, all of the other things 
that, that we contend with, it's just like discrimination is literally and racial bias and anti-Blackness is killing us. And, you know, Dr. Moultrie said this earlier, we've been saying this for centuries. I mean, literally for centuries, not much has changed in terms of the, the ways in which we have expressed how we want to be heard, how we want to be taken care of, how we want to be treated fairly and humanely. And it literally has gotten to the point where the United States is experiencing global embarrassment around the disrespect of Black lives with these horrible statistics on Black maternal health, Black infant mortality rates, the, the kinds of racial oppressions that people have, all of these studies that are coming out, not, not even many are not conducted by black people, but by white folk. White folk are literally in these spaces conducting these studies and saying, oops, there's a lot of anti-blackness going around and it's harming black folk. And it's only now in the 21st century that medical organizations and institutions and practitioners and nurses finally wanna listen. I mean, that's the thing that's incredible to me where I often say, White folk have to stop being disingenuous about the knowledge and presence that racism exists. I work for the library company in Philadelphia, first country, the country's first library of Congress. We literally have over a million pieces and much of that is rooted in colonial American history and politics, the new national era, all the way up to the end of the 19th century. And literally black folk in different languages across the, the Atlantic world have been literally saying the same thing. And the white response has literally been the same. I wrote an article for the Houston Chronicle and the Washington Post just recently, where I literally show almost an unchanging line from the 1700s to the 21st century, unchanging. And so this attempt to act as if you don't know for me, that's where the hypocrisy comes in. And literally white folk will literally say the same things that Dr. Moultrie and I are saying. And all of a sudden people wanna pay attention and listen or the United States becomes shamed and then they have to try and change those statistics. So yes, weathering happens, it affects us on the daily, but the medical industry is going to have to change and white folk are going to have to stop raising children who are anti-Black and misogynist so that they are not representative of those medical residents and students at UVA in 2016. I got nothing to add. That said it all. <laughs> right, I'm over here like, amen. All right. right. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> amen. Um, so Monique, uh, Margaret asks, well, I'm just gonna read her whole question. Liberation is a term that many religious communities are familiar with and can relate to as they begin to think about liberation in relation to reproductive rights. She's wondering about the work that still needs to be done so that religious communities, especially Christian churches, can recognize reproductive justice principles as biblically and theologically grounded um, and how to work within the communities. I want to add to that so that we can help these medical communities be less racist and um, there was also a question that I'm gonna stick on the end of that is, do you know of any uh, black religious denominations that work towards reproductive justice? So we can answer both of those questions at the same time. Yeah, so, so I will, I will lean in here to the work that RCRC has been doing, um, historically has been doing from having a seat at the table when the term was created, reproductive justice, to um, their contemporary projects. Uh, and so I, I think that they have been a, a large contributor to giving language to the conversations around how to take up tenants. So for example, a couple of years ago, I, I participated with Dr. Carrie Jackson with, um, it's probably sitting on my floor. Oh, the compassionate care for reproductive decisions and loss uh, training that RCRC did. And part of what that training did was try to speak to what are the values of reproductive justice that are picked up uh, that are already a part of the language of religious communities, like compassion, like um, caregiving, um, like trust, that these are not just values that are belonging to the pro-choice or pro-life camp, that these are religious values that we can talk about and we can articulate. Um, at 
one point, the AME Church had a response, a, a RJ response, and I don't know what happened with that. Uh, it was sort of like a flash in the pan. I remember seeing a statement uh, that it wasn't really about abortion access or, or paying attention to that component, but it was a statement that included this, in, in fact, included the term reproductive justice as a concept of talking about um, the, the ways in which communities need more than just the one thing. We don't need just adoption, but we also need like the systems that provide our students with educational opportunities that take the lead out of our water, that, you know, that provide environments that are healthy and safe. Um, but I don't think that there has been a wholesale push. I, I do know, I, and my research is within Black religious communities, so all the examples I'm going to give you are, are organizations that are working with Black communities. I know that Sister Reach and Sister Song both have done outreaches to religious communities. Sister Reach has done the most extensive. Uh, they do on a maybe monthly basis, maybe it's every two or three months, uh, they do workshops and webinars and conversations around reproductive justice and religious values. And again, they're pretty tied into Christian churches. So I, I would like to see this um, more widespread in more communities than just Christian communities, because at least with the African American and, and Black diasporic communities, uh, that I think IFA principles are you know, much more in line. One of the connections Patrice Cullors has to the Ifa tradition is the fact that some of her, the concepts of reproductive justice that she needed as she was parenting, starting to parent, uh, were already clear values within their practice uh, that are highlighted in ways that I don't think uh, some black religious expressions uh, do that work. Uh, but I, I would start there. I would start with both Sister Reach and Sister Song uh, and they have like built out components, uh, but Sister Reach most importantly has this built out component as well as the Religious Institute for, what was it, Sexual Morality, Deborah Hefner's group she, um, that she used to run. I'm not sure who the executive director is now. Uh, that, that group also had uh, worship resources. So things that you could put in like your, your church bulletin um, to talk about reproductive justice uh, to bring up this language in the tenants. So they had built out kind of a curriculum uh, of sorts uh, that was beyond just Christianity, because I do remember seeing some Seder uh, comment, commentaries, things that you could include in the um, Friday Juma prayer for Muslim communities. So that's another space uh, that you could go to for actual things that you could place into the hands of your religious leader. Deirdre, you didn't want to respond to that. Nope. Okay. <laughs> um, Dr. Jackson says, because of lack of funding, the Religious Institute has closed, um, unfortunately. So I just want to make that note. Um, we have a few more questions. And um, please, again, folks, upvote them and ask questions. I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and so this is for both of you. And I'm, I'm sure that RCRC has done or will do an entire panel on adoption, but can y'all please talk about institutional racism within the industry of adoption and the notion that a person has a right or deserves to parent um, such that when someone else decides that a black woman does not deserve to parent and their child is put into the foster care system and then adopted by white parents? I'm probably gonna defer in all honesty, I see um, Astrid, I don't know enough about the, you know, the adoption industry. Um, I do know the most industries in this country <laughs> are racist and, and elitist in classes, um, but I really don't know enough to, to answer that, I think, you know, with full confidence, unfortunately. May I jump in with that one? Um, we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago on the adoption industry. And we were looking very specifically at certain religious, conservative religious groups that have been encouraging their members to adopt 
to have more children to, for kingdom building purposes. This was Christian groups. What they had been doing was transnational, transracial adoptions, but not adopting as many black kids in this country who need adoption. So, you know, as Monique was talking earlier, one element that has happened is making the case that black mothers are default black, bad mothers, and then they're more likely for their children to go into the foster care system instead of them getting the kinds of supports that are needed for the health raising of children. And so family courts are also quicker to discontinue the parenting rights of, of black parents. Those who then go into the foster system, very few of them are being adopted. If they are adopted, as, as one person said, it might often be in white families. Now, what has happened that we learned this in the, the uh, webinar we did, the transnational adoption rate has gone down significantly in part because other countries uh, adoption policies have shifted, but also because what they are finding in those other countries, the children who need to be adopted are similarly situated in, in, in life realities as black kids in this country who need to be adopted. They are more likely to have financial trauma, racial trauma, domestic violence trauma, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this real push. And I think that's part of why the abortion laws are becoming more restrictive because just as the turn of the last century, white women were being encouraged to have more babies, to keep this a white nation. And so this whole uh, adoption and abortion, there's an intersection with those two that we really need folks to, to look at and what happens with Black children in the, the, con, in the midst of all of those, those realities. Those are really challenging. I don't know if you want to add anything, Monique or, or Brandon. The one component um, that I have, because again, my research focus is in Black religious communities, the um, the focus, my, my initial research project was on Black single sexuality uh, and uh, these single movements uh, like Pinky Promise and Wives in Waiting. And both of them have started initiatives, uh, I, I laugh kind of tongue in cheek, for women who have not completed the program. So women who have become pregnant because they were not abstinent, they did not remain abstinent. And so they've created these programs in a sense of like, let's adopt our own, uh, because they are still again, like ab abortion is a bad thing, it's a moral imperative bad thing is what they're promoting. Uh, and yet they realize that the model doesn't work for everyone. Uh, and thus, what do you do with these babies? Uh, and so uh, I've been watching that really carefully as well, because I'm seeing some really startling concerning rhetoric around uh, this language of sort of like love the sin, hate the, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner that gets mapped onto these children, that their, um, their creation came out of God's will. So the language around uh, un, uh, children born out of wedlock, that this, this rhetoric is still current, uh, despite the fact that it makes literally no sense. Uh, but I'm, I'm also troubled by that. So yeah, I'm, I'm troubled by uh, watching some racially blind, quote unquote, parents uh, seek to help Africa or seek to help African-Americans by adopting black children. Uh, because I think that racially blind is gonna set this kid up for failure uh, in some significant ways. But I'm also concerned about these spiritually blind communities that are using this language around um, uh, adoption uh, that sees it as a, a way to salvage this sinful act of sexuality and that and that stigma stays with the child in ways that I'm, I'm particularly concerned about within Black religious communities as well. That camera lag. Thank you for that. Um, I think the, the whole notion of transracial adoption could be its own thing. Um, especially as it relates to religious communities and Black religious communities. 
Um, but that's my, I pastored in Utah talking. Um, do we have time for one more question? We will take one more and then we're gonna, okay. we're gonna go. So I wanna ask Sabrina's question. What are some of the current pieces of legislation that prioritize reproductive justice for black women and who are your coalition partners that are in consistent conversation with you on this issue? So in, in Nebraska, I know of one that's currently, um, you know, been introduced and that's legislative bill 416 uh, by Senator, I think her name, uh, I'm not, I'm still kind of new to Nebraska, so I'm not going to say, say her name, but it's legislative bill 416. And essentially it, it, it contains the components of, of reproductive justice, but primarily what it's saying is folk need to recognize that maternal care extends beyond just giving birth. And so they're really asking for the leave period for um, these birthing people and their children to actually heal and for, for new parents, um, you know, or, or parents who have just given birth to be able to spend time nurturing the children. In terms of my own um, coalition partners, most of them are not necessarily focused on legislation. They're focused on education and curriculum development. There's only one group I'm working with in Omaha. Ashley Spivey is the founder and director of IB Black Girl. And they have, a, it's a, a black woman owned um, and managed group. And they are the ones who are actively looking at reproductive justice legislatively. But that's, that's really it for me. All the others are really concerned with curriculum development. Yeah, and to, to the question of the legislative arm, I, I look at groups like Sister Song that um, have tried and had some success uh, across the nation in fighting back these fetus bills that are just rubber stamped. So the language is exactly the same where uh, each state is trying to introduce language in the state's constitution that prohibits abortion or the fetal heartbeat bills that prohibit abortion at the uh, detection of a fetal heartbeat that what I've seen uh, RJ groups do in trying to fight these bills is to speak to the larger funded organizations that are about abortion uh, and abortion access and say, you will continue to lose this battle if you keep fighting the argument against the bill about being about abortion. What you need to be talking about is the criminalization of black mothers, the, the uh, impact that this is gonna have on healthcare for people who choose not to go and be treated because uh, they don't want the medicalization process to seek the fetal heartbeat and thus prevent them from getting access to um, reproductive care. And so they're trying to expand the conversation beyond uh, the abortion access point uh, and, and I think that they've been more effective in sort of turning the tide on some of this legislation, because in some states, like I'm in Tennessee, uh, our bill just got rubber stamped over the summer. They had a special initiative to, to pass the bill. And when I met with Planned Parenthood and we were doing lobbying days, that was my like knocking my head against the wall. Like, why are we only debating this one comp this one part of the bill? The whole bill is trash. Let's talk about how the bill will prohibit access to X, Y, Z, and all of these other things. Cause it's not just they threw that one thing in, they, they're taking access in a whole host of ways. And I think RJ groups are the only ones I think in at least that I've been exposed to that are screaming that out loud uh, as uh, these legislative acts are being uh, debated that they're, they're bringing to the table deeper, more full conversations. We're gonna wrap. Brandy, thank you for being our moderator. Deirdre and Monique, thank you for being the amazing panelists that you are with such a depth and, and wealth of knowledge. I encourage everyone on this call, watch the legislative bills that are being introduced in your state. That is where the action is as it relates to voting rights, as it relates to uh, reproductive rights, all of that is happening in the state. And as Monique said, there's this rubber stamping and there's a passing from one state to another of some of these bills. Watch those bills testify. We really need people of faith, especially. And if you're a clergy person, I rarely wear my clergy collar, 
But when I testify in state legislature, that's when I make sure I wear it. Let them know that you are a person of faith, even if you don't have a some kind of, of garb that suggests that. It's really, really important that our voices, the voices of people of faith are part of that conversation to push against the narrative that a small minority of religious people in this country use the term pro-life in a way that is so anti-life. So please do that. We will have state legislators who are in support of women making their own reproductive decisions who will be with us on March 30th. So please, if you want to know more about what's happening and how to not just be in the defense with various legislation, but also how to present some things in a very offense, um, proactive way, because we really, really need that and partner with legislators in your own states. Thank you again, panelists and awesome moderator. And thank you, our wonderful audience. Um, I hope this has been valuable for you. Your questions have been very valuable for us and your, your comments as well. God bless you. Peace in and peace out. I, I love to say that. So thank you so very much. Blessings to you.